This morning's reading is from Acts chapter 6, verses 10, or 1 through 10. You can start from the right spot. You can find it on page 94 in the New Testament in the Bible in front of you. I'm reading from an NIV version, so there will be a little bit of difference. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebrew, Hebrew Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, Choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give their attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. <laughs> this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Herminius, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert from a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen a man full of God's grace and power performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the Freedom, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke the word of God for the children of God. Thank you, God. Jesus has been crucified. A couple years have passed. And by this time, there were probably between 20 and 30,000 new Christians in the city of Jerusalem. But everyday life goes on. People must be taken care of. The apostles are trying, but they can't do everything. And so, after this disagreement about some widows not being taken care of, the disciples decide to call, the apostles decide to call some of the disciples together. Now, when I was reading this, I thought back to a few years ago here in our congregation when the minister did everything. And I thought how the disciples must have gone to the apostles and said, Hey, Peter, you look tired, man. What can I do to help you? Others must have come and said, Really? What do you need? I'm, I'm on fire. I want to do something. What can I do to help? You look tired. You're exhausted. You cannot do it all. And they were right. No one can do it all. Today was a lot like yesterday. During Stephen's time, there was cooking that had to be done, housekeeping, caring for children, checking on elderly parents, laundry, all kinds of things had to be done. You still had to have time to preach, go to synagogue, practice the law of Moses. All of this in a 24-hour day, day after day. So problems of caring for the people begin to take its toll on the apostles. And the apostles are spread so thin to be continually diverted in caring for the problems. And these problems threaten to do what the Jewish leaders could not do. All of the time spent away from preaching threatened to stop the spread of the word of Jesus. 
So the apostles called the disciples and asked for help. They called for seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and wisdom. Now the apostles can devote themselves to prayer and to serving the word of the Lord. Stephen is the first chosen. But who was Stephen? Well, we know from Acts 6, 5, that he was a faithful man of God, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Stephen would be one of the seven responsible for the distribution of food to the widows in the early church. He was also a man full of God's grace and power, and it says he performed great wonders and signs among the people. But that's about all we know about Stephen. We don't know anything about his personal life. Who were his parents? Did he have brothers and sisters? Did he have children? But we do know what was truly important. He is a faithful man. Even when faced with certain death, Stephen was not concerned about his earthly existence. He decided to stand firmly, stand firmly on the side of Christ. Stephen was the first Christian martyr. He was stoned to death. Before his death, the opposition of the Jews had been limited to threats of imprisonment, verbal abuse, and finally to imprisonment and beating. And then beginning with Stephen's stoning, a point of fury that could only be satisfied with blood instigated the first in the series of persecutions that continue in the church today. As Stephen was dying, he prayed to God to receive his spirit. And he asked God not to hold the sin against his killers. Does that sound familiar? In Jewish tradition, one who has been accused of blasphemy does not receive any honors at his funeral. He was lucky if he even got one. But Act two tells us, um, Acts 8, verse 2 tells us, devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentations. I always wonder what that was. It's a beating of their chest. They're beating their chest as they cry over Stephen. The fact that they did this, that they buried Stephen and they cried out for him, was a sign of respect that this, self, this faithful servant had on others. Men who had courage enough amidst all this persecution to show a respect to the dead body of this holy martyr, which they took from under the stones, washed it, wound it up in linen cloth, and buried him. We don't know if they had permission from the Sanhedrin. I suspect they did not. So how much courage did that take to go out in front of a bloodthirsty crowd and collect Stephen's body and prepare it for burial and to cry out? Stephen's death created an unexpected boost to Christianity. The Christians in Jerusalem were then so heavily persecuted that many fled to other cities, towns, and countries. These scattered disciples taught people in other places about the message and the life of Jesus. Multitudes more were converted to Christianity. Imagine a brand new phase of Christianity. It was a long time ago, wasn't it? One of the things that I hear often today is the Bible doesn't matter anymore. It's old stories. Things have changed. This has nothing to do with my everyday life. Oh, how sad when people think that. It's not much different than today. Life goes on, right? Remember how I began the sermon? People had to cook, clean, housekeeping, laundry, earn money, eat, pray, take care of kids, pay the bills, preach, check on their aging parents, repair the roof, go to synagogue. Widows and orphans still need food, 
still need shelter, still need clothing. How did the apostles fit in preaching, healing, and miracles with everyday events that must occur? But again, not much different than today, is it? Think about Reverend Joel and other preachers. Reverend Joel is a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. He's on fire for it. But remember, problems of caring for the people begin to take its toll on the apostles. To be spread so thin, to be continually diverted in caring for problems, threatens to accomplish what the Jewish leaders had ordered, an end to the preaching about Jesus. Could the same be said for Reverend Joel and other ministers? Do they get spread too thin? They do. So, now it comes to you. How can you help? People stepped up when the apostles asked for help. And hopefully others will too today. Thank the good Lord we have trustees. Thank you, Harry. He's had a terrible week, if you've not seen. This building has roofs that leak. We have a lot of plumbing problems. And we have other concerns. The worship committee changes the colors, decorates the sanctuary, helps plan the service. Sunday school teachers teach the young children. Deb fixes meals. Lisa does the office work. Stephen ministers help too. The people who brought the candles up behind the acolytes today were either Stephen ministers or people who have identified themselves as Stephen care receivers. The Stephen minister spiritually help those in need and get some, a small portion of help to Joel and members of our church. Ministers are there when we need help. If we had someone die and my family, I would expect Joel to be there, to hold my hand when I called and said, I don't know what to do. I'm lost. The ministers are there when we get a call that something bad has happened. We've gone through some crisis. Our home is burned down. But crises don't end in one week. They can take a long time to have their effects. Kind of like a pebble in a pond. It just keeps going. And I think it must be very hard for the pastors to be there after that initial crisis. I mean, can you imagine? Mike's mother died a year ago, here in a couple weeks, and Joel's been wonderful. But how unrealistic to expect him to come to my house every week for an hour, hour and a half, and just be there. When there's other crises happening with other families. Is it possible for a minister to do it all and continue to be on fire for Christ? And again, this is where you come in. You can continue the work of Stephen. You can assist the minister. You can help someone going through a very difficult time. What is Stephen ministry? Galatians 6 verse 2 tells us, Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Stephen Ministry congregations equip and empower lay caregivers called Stephen Ministers to provide one-on-one, -on -one, high-quality, confidential, Christ-centered spiritual care to people who are hurting. Now, when I say hurting, we know if our spouse dies, we're hurting. We know if our home burns down, we're hurting. But sometimes I think people think Stephen Ministries just for those ultimate horrible days. We hurt in lots of ways. Loneliness, fear. 
What are the blessings of a Stephen ministry? There are many, many blessings. Congregations receive a practical and powerful way to respond to Christ's commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. The pastor has a team of gifted, trained, and committed lay caregivers ready to minister to hurting people. The lay people themselves nurture and use their gifts in meaningful, meaningful ministry, growing spiritually as they serve others. People who are hurting have a compassionate companion, a caring Christian friend who provides emotional and spiritual support. What about you? Are you looking for a way? Have you felt a calling and you didn't know where to turn, how to use it? Stephen Ministry is compatible with your age. If you're over 21 and you get the training, you can be a Stephen Minister. Your current life situation, whatever it is, it's okay. Your spiritual gifts, God gave them to you. We need to use them. Do you have a lot of empathy for people who are suffering emotionally? Do you have experience with bereavement and grief issues? Have you dealt with personal losses? Do you have life experience that would help you bring comfort to others who might be experiencing these tough times? By becoming a Stephen minister, you'll be matched with someone who you might be able to help. And all you have to do is listen and pray with them. But now the other side of life. The side that Stephen saw every day. You and I face challenges every day on a regular basis. Break a hip, then your ankle hurts. You get the ankle fixed and you break your hand, right? You have a fire in your home, you got problems with the insurance. It just goes on and on and on. No matter what, though, stay true to the Lord. Nothing else is as important as staying true to the Lord. Please stay true to the Lord. Oh, that sounds so easy, doesn't it? I'd be surprised if every single person in this building has not at one time or another thought, what are you doing? I don't see the plan here. This isn't working for me. Have you ever thought to yourself, this is so devastating. I don't know what to do. I don't even have words to describe this. I am so alone. What will you do in the wake of the worst moment of your life? At an intersection of tragedy or crisis, will that day drive you from your faith or to a new depth of trust in God? God wants to use every moment of your life for good. If your faith can be proved in the wake of your worst day ever, then you've got a powerful faith, a mighty powerful faith. In the early days of the church, many people who witnessed the murder of Stephen felt it was the worst day of their lives. Stephen had been one of the most popular and effective preachers in the early church. He was godly to the core. He was filled with grace and love and the ability to do the signs and wonders as he prayed in the name of Jesus. Stephen was one of a kind. And many people looked up to him. Thousands of new believers worshipped in Jerusalem, and most of them must have loved Stephen. I've known several worse days, and I'm betting you have too. Or perhaps your worst day is just at the next intersection. When it comes to your worst day, know this. It is possible to trust God after the worst day of your life. In fact, trusting God on that day will be your only hope. But if you feel alone, abandoned, angry, doubtful of God's plan, Stephen Ministry can help you when you ask to become a Stephen Care Receiver. One thing to remember is who God is. Many of us can easily point to a day when everything went wrong. 
Perhaps it was a sudden heart attack or a diagnosis of cancer or the sudden death of a soulmate. It could have come with personal financial crisis, the loss of a job, retirement, children concerns, divorce. Maybe you feel lonely or need someone objective to talk to. For the early Christians, Stephen's funeral only promised more funerals. It is now open season on Christians in Jerusalem. So they escaped Jerusalem, but the persecution followed them throughout Judea. Then it followed them through Samaria. They ran towards Galilee, Asia, Egypt, Rome. They pulled up their roots trying to make sure they always had enough money they could pack up easily and be ready to move in a moment's notice. If life has declared open season on you, know this. It's an unfortunate part of life. Nothing in the Bible, nothing in the nature of God suggests that bad things won't happen in the course of life. If we live long enough, some things, in fact, will crush us. But know something else. The worst day of your life does not change the nature of God or the nature of God's love for you. The worst day of your life is just that, the worst day of your life. It doesn't negate your existence. It doesn't change your love for others around you. Stephen Ministers will help you remember who God is, and when you remember who God is, then you've begun the survival process. Remember what God can do. Consider this verse from Acts 8, verse 4. One little sentence. Those who have been scattered preach the word wherever they went. That's it. One sentence but it represents an incredible movement of God's people. They recorded the gospel in writing and took the message of Jesus to every corner of the world. Thanks to the persecution of God's people, thanks to the worst days of those lives, the message of Christ became a worldwide phenomenon. Why did good come out of bad after the worst day in so many lives? Because people remember what God could do. It might not have taken long before they saw the good coming out of the bad. Before Stephen's death shook its very foundation, the church was an exciting, hopeful place to be. A group of people with almost no troubles or fears. Because when trouble had come, the miracles had come too. No hardship that they went through had been able to win against these new believers. With a church like that, who would want to leave Jerusalem? But suddenly, however, the honeymoon was over. And the church realized life would never be the same again. It must have been discouraging, mystifying, to the point of depression for those new believers. They must have asked in a daze, what happened? Why had God let them down? Why hadn't God rescued Stephen? If God had allowed Stephen a glimpse of heaven as he was dying, why hadn't God simply shown the stone throwers who was really boss? In the aftermath of disaster, many of those Christians couldn't figure it out. Maybe they reflected on a teaching that said God could bring good out of every situation. Maybe they wondered, as you may have at some crisis, how could any good come from all this bad? From the early Christian's vantage point, the death of a good man, families running like refugees, events that didn't look like the good work of God, must have been confusing. But for us today, the entire process was a wonderful thing. If Stephen hadn't died, and if the church had never scattered, 
what do you think would have become of it? Christianity might have stayed in Jerusalem forever and then disappeared. But God had a plan. God wanted the message in Asia, so he allowed the persecution. God wanted the message in Africa, so he allowed a terrible thing to happen. God wanted the message of grace to land in Europe, so he allowed the messengers of death to follow the same roads as the refugees. God wanted you to have a home in heaven, so he took away the home of countless early Christians. In a sense, God used the persecution to, persecution to chase the gospel to every corner of the world. God works in difficult situations. It must have taken years for those early Christians to realize it. It turns out God was working the entire time. Some of them never saw how God was at work, but he was working just the same. God could be working in a difficult situation in your life right now. It could be that it'll be years before you understand the why of a rough time. You may never understand the underlying reason behind a crisis. It could be you'll never know the answers. Faith is believing that God is at work during the worst day of your life even when you cannot see how he is working. Trust God. He can bring good out of the worst day of your life. And God is the only one that can do that. God is in control. And God is good. And he has graced us with Stephen Minister to walk with you and me and God on our worst days. The most important part of the story of Stephen's death and the persecution of the believers may be contained in a simple phrase from verse 5. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. At first glance, these few words may not impress you, but consider this. It's believed Philip is the same as mentioned in Acts 6, verse 5. One of the seven disciples selected to serve the church. Philip is listed after Stephen. Were they close friends? Did they laugh together? Did they eat together? Very likely. Did Philip hurt to see what happened to Stephen? Did it tear his heart out to see that murdered body? It must have crushed him. It must have broken his heart to hold his friend. To see him wrapped in a grave sheet to lay him to rest in a tomb, to know he would never see the flash of his buddy's smile again. But Philip did what we all must do after our worst day. Philip kept breathing. He put one foot in front of the other. He made plans for the next day of his life, and he kept his faith. He did not turn away from his God. He did not leave the family of faith. And he did not lose his trust in Christ. And that's the point, isn't it? When the worst day of your life comes, you'll have to either abandon your faith as useless or keep your faith as the only thing of value in your life. There is no middle ground. If you can make the courageous decision to keep putting one foot in front of the other, if you can make the important faith step of turning to God for your strength, you'll discover a wonderful reality. God can use the worst day of your life to take your faith into new areas of strength, to work miracles in the wake of tragedy, 
and to bring good out of something that was no good at all. That's power. That's the kind of power you'll find only under the care of the Holy Spirit. So when you wake up in the morning after your worst day, read your Bible. When you get over the shock, pray. When you gather your wits about you, spend some time in the praise of God and thanksgiving to God and worshiping the holy God. When Sunday comes, be in church. Be around those Christians that God has given you. Talk to a Stephen minister. These are all faithful steps, steps of trust. Take them. They are the blessings that God has given you. Keep taking those steps, no matter how small they are. Just keep walking. Again, it sounds easy. The walking's hard. When the worst day of your life comes, the pain is beyond unbearable. And it will hurt forever. We are designed to hurt, to grieve, to cry, to panic, to scream, to raise our fist, to fall on the ground and admit that we can't take the pain anymore. That's the way we're made. And it's true, too, that if you open your Bible on the day after your worst day, if you pray on the morning after, go back to church, the pain will still be there. That's when a Stephen minister can help you. It takes time for the grief process to work in its course, and we grieve after any loss. It takes time and a working and talking through the process. God never meant for us to suffer alone. He's there with us, and he provides for others to help us through other ministries in this church. If you manage to read your Bible, to pray, to thank God for his goodness, and be around your church family in the wake of your worst day, then you are exercising your faith. And in time, that exercise of faith will bear wonderful fruit. Colossians 3, verses 2 to 3, could have been written about the life of Stephen, even though they are applicable to all of us. Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Stephen's life and even more so his death, should be an example of how every believer should strive to live, committed to the Lord in the face of death, faithful to preach the gospel boldly, knowledgeable of God's truth, and willing to be used by God for his plan and purpose. Stephen's ministry over all these years continues. It stands as a beacon, a light to the lost and grieving world. Amen.